Next, from Chicago, our contributing correspondent Jeff Berkowitz talks with State Representative David Harris. We hear more about the effort to reach some agreement over how to reform the pensions of state workers. This runs about 30 minutes. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. And we're going to be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest State Rep. David Harris, General David Harris. He is a two-star general. He's had an interesting career because he got some time off for good behavior. David was a state rep back from 83 to 92, or thereabouts. That's correct. And uh, then became, went to the private sector, senior vice president, LMI Hospital Association, commanding general of the LMI National Guard for four years, mobilizing troops for Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom, working in the State Department, U.S. State Department in Iraq, in civil, what we call that, civil society job? Civil society job, reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Then he returned to the State House after what, I guess after three decades, no, two decades, two decades off for good behavior. And they said they sentenced him to serve again. So he started serving Arlington Heights. And well, you were in the 66th district. You were running this year after redistricting in the 53rd district. That's correct. And Arlington Heights and Mount Prospect would be the major portion of that district. Maybe 90% or so of the people in your district come from those two areas, but then a sliver from Prospect Heights and Des Plaines, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And we're here, folks, to talk about pension, state employee pension reform. We're taping this show on June 6, 2012. And you know, people who don't follow us too closely, they come up to me, and I know that I was in Springfield, you were in Springfield last week, and they said, well, they say WTF. Can we say WTF? I guess we can say whatever that means. Like, what the hell happened there? I mean, you're the state rep, you're the legislature, legislator, and you know, your combined experience from before and now is about 12 years, and people thought they sent you down to fix things. The Illinois, the state employee pensions, there are five funds and they're a mess, and um, they adjourned on May 31st, and very little, well, some of the media would say very little was fixed. Senate President John Carlton say major change, they passed the Senate passed a bill that had major savings for two of the funds. Another problem was it wasn't passed by the House, so it isn't yet legislation. And so is Senate President Cullerton right? Did the Senate do, do some good things, and was the House a laggard because she didn't pass anything? Not, not, I don't think he's, I don't think Could I make that question longer for you, David? Could I make that question longer? I don't, I don't think he said that. about five minutes. Yeah, I don't think he said that. And I think that the legislature. You don't think who said that? I don't think that uh, President uh, Cullerton said that, that, uh, that uh, we didn't do anything. No, he didn't. I'm saying that. But he, he said certainly the Senate had some major accomplishments. As did, as did the House. So let me ask the, you, the did House the Senate have major accomplishments? The House and the Senate, remember, it takes both chambers to pass a bill and send it to the governor. The House and the Senate passed a budget, which is a which is a reasonable, good budget that lives within our means, that lays out a plan, that lives within the revenue constru uh, constructs that we have laid out for the coming year. We reformed Medicaid. Some people would say we didn't do enough, but we did reform Medicaid. We significantly reduced the uh, Medicaid eligibility. Uh, we put some additional uh, dollars into the system by passing a, uh, a cigarette tax to help fund Medicaid. We passed reform of enterprise zones, which is a major uh, initiative on the business uh, on the business front. And uh, as an example, on one of our big uh, liabilities, an $800 million liability that we had every year was retiree health care, which the state was providing basically for free. That is now going to change. So there were major accomplishments by both the House and the Senate. The one thing that was left undone is pension reform. The Senate passed a bill that dealt with reforming two of the five state systems, specifically the General Assembly Retirement System and the State Employee Retirement System. That makes progress, but in my estimation, not nearly enough progress of what we need to make. Of course, the House has to, has to deal with that bill that the Senate passed, but we need to yeah, reform so it's not, it's all not law five yet. systems. Right. But only, it's not law that dealt with two of the five funds. It's the Senate That's passing correct. a bill that dealt with two of the five That's funds, correct. but the House hasn't. So the law has not changed at right. all. And there's, there's been no, there has been no change in the state pension systems, those five state pension systems, state employees, general assembly, judges, university employees, and teachers. No and, change whatsoever. And the major change that occurred, I know you're in the House, but you're familiar with what happened in the Senate. What was the major change in the Senate bill that passed regarding state employee pensions? 
I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you, because I haven't seen the, the bill come over yet. Um, well, wasn't the, it my understanding? I was down there in Springfield for a little bit, and it's very hard. Lots of strange things going on, just, just even knowing where things are. You see, I thought I knew this stuff, but I don't. I don't know, I don't know Jack, you know, because I know politics, I know public policy issues, and I'm an upstate guy. I go down to Springfield, I can barely find my way onto the Senate or House floor. I need, you know, State Representative David Harris as a guide. But, okay, I found my way onto the floor. I'm watching from the press box, and it appears that the legislation that passed in the Senate at the end of the session, as you said, it applies to two funds. It applies to the General Assembly and to state employees. Mm -hmm. That would be SERS as opposed to as state SERS as opposed to SURS. So it's not the university mm -hmm. people, right. state employees. Right. And Governor Quinn had suggested three major reforms. He had suggested raising employee contributions by, I think, 9% to 12%, by 3%. And he suggested increasing the retirement age. I'm simplifying. It's more complicated. From 55 or 62 to 67. And he suggested modifying the COLA, the cost of living adjustment. And that's what the Senate chose to address. They didn't do anything on the retirement age, didn't do anything on employment, employment contributions. Some of the senators I talked to, Matt Murphy in particular, said the real money is in the COLA adjustment. So he, for one, didn't seem that upset that they hadn't dealt with or adjusted the retirement age or the employee contributions. In any case, the COLA adjustment, as I understand it, is that in the past it had been a compounded 3% increase. It's kind of a misnomer to call it a COLA or cost it's just of a, living it's adjustment. Just a, it's just an automatic increase. An in automatic pension. escalation of pensions right. at 3% a year. Right. They Compound, rate of, compounded annually. The rate of inflation during that period could have been 1%. Doesn't matter. The COLA would be 3%. Rate of inflation could have been 5%. Doesn't matter. COLA was going to be 3%. As it turned out for a number of the years recently, the COLA 3% adjustment is much in excess of the actual rate of inflation, at least the consumer price index. I think that's the case. In any case, the change is to say in the future, the adjustment for pensions will be one half of the consumer price index increase or 3%, whichever is less. So hypothetically, if the consumer price index went up 3%, the adjustment would be 1.5%, not 3%. And, and it will be simple increases as opposed to compounded. That is, the increase won't apply to the increments that have been added on. It will apply to the, just the original salary. Did I say that right? I hope I did. And if that's sound right, that, that, <coughs> that, that is a proposal that was out there, and that may be contained in the bill. Uh, when you get into pensions, they are mind-numbing numbers. And, yes, that idea of using one-half of 1% one uh, of what the, uh, of what the uh, CPI is, is properly contained in the bill. Does that bill pass in the House? I don't know. I come back and say it doesn't make any difference because we have a serious problem on pensions and we have to adjust all of the pension systems. And you mentioned the, the, the contributions. Contribution, each of the pension systems has, has different uh, factors to it. Right. As an example, <clears throat> for the General Assembly retirement system, the contribution factor right now, or the contribution that has to be made by the members of the General Assembly is uh, 11, I believe 11.4 percent. So the teachers on their pension system, they put in right now uh, 9.4 percent. Uh, the General Assembly puts in 11.4 percent or 11.5 percent. So it's, it's <coughs> different from each of those but five I th systems. I think that the point <coughs> is we need to reform <coughs> all five of those systems because okay. in my estimation, if we were a corporation, if the state of Illinois was a corporation, I would say that the pension problem poses an existential threat to the corporation. We are a state. We are a, a sovereign. We're not going to go out of business, but we can make no forward progress in Illinois yeah. until we get our pension problem under control. Yeah. If you're a corporation and you went for legal advice, your bankruptcy lawyer or legal advisor would probably say, why don't you folks file for bankruptcy? You've got so much debt relative to your ability to pay, debt being the amount that was supposed to be put into the pension funds and wasn't by the state government. Employees contributed what they were supposed to. The state government didn't. I think a bankruptcy lawyer would say to the state of Illinois, 
look, you've just got the, your ability to pay relative to how much you owe these funds, too much. File, you know, go, go over to your bankruptcy lawyer here at the corner and file. Is that, I mean, is this, this sort of what you're saying, I think, right? Well, uh, I'm saying that it, it, depending on the corporation. Let me just talk uh, as an example uh, about General Motors. General Motors just came out today. They have pension liabilities in excess of $100 billion, okay? General Motors. Mm -hmm. They are offering their retirees a buyout package if they will leave the pension system. It's going to be expensive for General Motors in the, in the upfront costs and shift a lot of the burden to, the, uh, to those folks who take that retirement system, mm -hmm. that retirement system buyout, but that would reduce General Motors' uh, but liability. General Motors, actually, and and th that's what we have, the type of thing that we have to do in the state of Illinois. We have to make adjustments in order to get us on track. And the other thing is the state cannot declare bankruptcy. There is no provision for a state declaring bankruptcy. So there's a difference. But actually, and, and General Motors, as I recall, did have a structured bankruptcy. Everybody said it was a bailout, but it was actually a structured bankruptcy with a bailout. Is that your understanding? Well, I, would, I would call it probably that, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, and now they're in, and they still have these pension obligations that, again, are dragging them down. And they have to, they have to reduce their pension obligations, mm -hmm. and they are willing to make a buyout to retirees. So it happens every day in the private sector. Changes are but made the, to the public. The and let me come back to one other thing yeah. you said. It's not just the state failing to make pension payments that has caused this problem. There are two other significant issues. One, benefits have been increased over the years for which participants have not been required to make increased contributions. Okay? So that has increased the funded liability. The other thing is, Jeff, if you and I would agree to die when we're 68 years old, that would, that would solve a lot of the problems. So the life problem expectancy. That, the problem now that we are living so much longer, in the Chicago Teachers Retirement Fund, as an example, fully 20% of their retirees are over the, years, uh, are over the age of 80. Mm -hmm. The pension system was built for people to die 68, 70 years old. If now they're living to 80, 85, and 90, that increases that liability substantially. Adjustments have to be made. The future of yeah. the state of Illinois is at risk. So if Henry Bear were here, and Henry, of course, <laughs> people who watch the show regularly know uh, they saw Henry when I interviewed him down in Springfield in the AFSCME offices. That's the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, probably by Henry's word, the largest public, public sector union in the country, and affiliates around the country, similar unions of similar states, Washington and so forth, maybe somewhat different names. But <clears throat> Henry said, Look, he, I guess he would dispute what you said because he said... I'm sure he would. Yeah, he didn't say anything about the life expectancy going up. And the other factor you said was employee contributions should have been increased as pension benefits were increased. They Absolutely. weren't. Henry doesn't say that, and I didn't ask him to be fair, so we'll have to do a second show with Henry. And you can watch that show by going to youtube.com slash public affairs TV, where you can watch all of our shows. And sometimes if you're not in the area, where we serve. We do share in Chicago and Rockford, Aurora, and often around the state of Illinois. But if you're not, you can watch it on the computer. And if you can't wait, because people are so excited to see these, like we're taping this on June 6th, but it may not show for a week or two, go to youtube.com and it's usually posted a day or two later. But in any case, <clears throat> so you watch that interview with Henry Bear. Henry basically says the problem is the state didn't put in the employee right. country. You would agree that's a part of the problem. That's absolutely a part maybe of the problem. Maybe even the major part of the problem. It's maybe 45% of okay. the problem, maybe a half. But so it, Henry it's says a big part of the, the solution is easy. Just raise taxes because he says, you know, if you had a pro progressive tax code, you could t raise taxes on the wealthy, not on you little folks. He didn't we just raise taxes folks. by 67? But he said, you know, that was not raising it on the oh, that wealthy. Wasn't that was nobody that wasn't says enough. that everybody had to pay for that because uh. we have a proportional income tax, and some would say a regressive income tax because if you say you only pay, we were paying three percent every individual, and that was raised to five percent. If you have very few deductions, that means as people get higher incomes and their uh, expenditures don't really increase, so they're, they're actually, and their deductions may. The point is, Henry may say, and he may be right, that the effective tax rate as you have higher incomes actually declines. Do you, okay, do we you have, agree we with have that possibly? We have a flat You're on the revenue have, have, I'm on a revenue committee. You are the we ranking have, member on the House Republican Revenue Republican member. So let me Republican ask member. you, let, we have, we let have me a do, flat, We have me. a flat tax okay. rate. We have a flat tax rate. Does it mean, but is, is but, it regressive? So we, should, so we should raise tax, we just raised taxes 67%, 67%. We brought in an additional roughly eight 
$8 billion, $7 to $8 billion in new revenue into the state of Illinois, and we're still in a terrible situation, and now you're telling me we should raise taxes again to do nothing more than pay Henry for wants public lower... service employees' mm-hmm. pensions? But he says Absolutely it's, not. It's fair, didn't his point? Absolutely not. And look, even State Representative Daniel Biss, you know Daniel Biss, I know right? him very well, a great guy. You know, and here's this. We always give it this book, Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman. You know that book, right? I have read it. Have you read that book? I have not read it, but I know it. If I give it to you, will you I read, will it? read it? You promise now? <laughs> I promise. You'll come back and give us a book I'll, report? I'm going to tell you, all right. All right. Because when I gave that, I gave a copy of that to Henry Bear, you know, and he, he says, you know, the thing is, Milton gets it wrong. You have to always, he doesn't think the free market works so much, number one. And number, that's Henry Bear. And number two, he's saying, you know, you should, when you talk about this, you know, raising taxes, you should tax the wealthy, he says. They have the ability to pay. So he says we should have a progressive tax code in Illinois, but you know the Illinois Constitution prohibits that. Right. So Henry says amend the U.S. Constitution to permit a progressive tax code. What do you say to Henry? Well, let me ask you two questions. Break it down one at a time. You said we have a proportional income tax. No, no, we have a flat income tax. Flat income tax, flat income tax. which means that people... With you higher pay, income, you pay 5%. Pay, you pay 5%. Pe- the percentage, yeah. in your view, stays the same. No matter what your income rate is, you're paying 5% is what you're saying. If you got a million dollars of income or if you got 200000 in income, the percentage pays stays the same. Of course, the actual 5%. amount is much higher for people with a million dollars than people with 100000 So roughly, putting aside the deductions, that means if somebody earns $50,000, then they would pay $2,500 in taxes currently, 5%, right? If somebody earns a million dollars, they pay 5% of that, that would be $50,000. Right. So $2,500, 50000 it's, it's 5% of your adjusted gross income. Okay, so it's a lot more in terms of actual dollars, but you're saying roughly it's the same. Henry's claiming that when you total things out and you look at deductions and people get tax breaks, et cetera, he claims that people with higher incomes pay less in terms of their state than lower income people. In, in Do you disagree with them? Do you in, disagree? in terms of actual dollars, they pay less, but it's a, it's a fair, flat tax. If no, you, no, but if, is the if, rate less? If, is the rate, are people paying 5% or do they end up due to tax credits and deductions and so forth? The tax credits Does and the deductions. the wealthy people end up paying less than 5%? The tax 5%? credits and deductions are available to anyone who has, has the opportunity to take okay. advantage of them. If you want to t- change the tax credits and deductions, fine, change the tax code. Okay. But, but, and but if, and, and, and if, Mr. if Mr. Bayer wants to have his allies in the General Assembly introduce a constitutional amendment to go to a proportional tax system versus a flat tax system, then well, let, not let them do that. proportional, but, but a progressive it is tax system. Pro- call it proportional, call it higher, progressive. Higher rates call it progressive, for higher income proportional, people. Proportional, whatever you want. If you want to change rates. from flat to progressive, okay. introduce the bill, introduce the constitutional amendment. Would you amendment. support him on that? I would absolutely not support him. Why, uh, why it, would you support because him? The, because the flat tax is fair. Because the problem is not the, number, the amount of revenue that we're bringing in. We are bringing in sufficient revenue. The problem is the amount of spending. Let me give you some numbers. As an example, this year, Our pension bill in the state of Illinois, in other words, we as the employer have to make these payments to the pension system, went from $4.2 billion in FY11 to to $5.1 billion in FY12. That's a $900 million increase in the pension payment alone. Our new revenue from FY11 to FY12 was only $700 million, which means that every single penny of new revenue that came into the state of Illinois because of increased economic activity, people are buying cars and the, and the sales tax revenue is up, every single penny of new revenue that comes into the state of Illinois for FY12 is going one place, that's to pay for pensions. It's not going for education, it's not going for health care, it's not going for transportation or agriculture. In fact, it's getting reduced. It's, it's getting reduced in some of these And others. you know what? Because we failed to act so far this year, the exact same situation happens for FY13. Every single penny of new revenue that comes into the state of Illinois has to go to pay for pensions. We have an $8 billion backlog of old bills. Forget about the pension payment. We have an $8 billion backlog of old bills that have to be paid. How do we pay those old bills when every single penny of new revenue comes in has to go to pay for pensions? The numbers don't lie, and I don't care what you say about, about any, any of the fooling around. The numbers are there, and they are crushing Illinois. We cannot make forward progress for this great state 
until we solve the pension problem. Okay, and so you've pointed out that the increase in revenue from the increase in the individual and corporate in, to, it, it, from the increase in the individual income tax rate and the corporate income tax rate that happened about a year and a half ago when we raised the income tax rate from three for individuals from three percent to five percent we raised the corporate rate I think from four point eight to seven point two percent virtually all of that revenue five billion dollars or six billion is going toward pensions or retiree health care costs and the point is point, say, but, okay. but is that is that well isn't that right because I mean, the, the amount of money you say, the pension payment, which was due, right. was $5.1 billion. For FY, that's right. This, for, this past fiscal year right. that just ended. The general, mm -hmm. okay, and that's $5.1 billion. There was a bond, there was a payment uh, that was issued, the pension funds borrowed a billion dollars. And in they order, borrowed more than that. Uh, well, at least a billion, uh, uh, they borrowed much more, and a billion had to be paid back in principal and interest. So out of this general revenue fund, First, you have the $5 billion payment, 5.1. Then you have a billion dollars to go to pay interest and principal on bonds owed by the pension fund. Then you have retiree health care costs of another billion and a half. You missed a half a billion in there. A billion and a half. So roughly $7.5 billion of the general revenue fund budget, which is $33 billion, $7.5 billion of that budget, almost 20, 22, 23% goes to retirees in one form or another. That's right. I, I, when you talk so, about you talked about the pension bonds and the pension notes, uh, we, we floated pension bonds in 03, we floated pension okay. notes in, in, in FY10, and those pension notes are costing us a okay. billion dollars a year. So that's, that, that's not included in the 5.1 that That's I before about. Illinois spends a substantial amount on education, right. on health care, especially for low-income people and Medicaid. Right. Before you start using money for that, for health care, education, law enforcement, you've got this seven and a half billion that kind of comes off the top. Absolutely. So if the GRF, the General Revenue Fund, is roughly thirty-three billion dollars, you're down to less than twenty-six billion just from paying your retiree costs. And now you've got to start dealing with education and health care. And the point I'm sort of making, you remember you used to have when you took economics, they used to talk about the choice between guns and butter. If you, took, if you took all of the economy in the country, you could say guns are sort of defense, butter consumption activities. Now, we don't mean just butter. We mean money spent on education, money spent on health care, and then national defense. That's how they used to divide the world, economists. But now, in Illinois and many other states, instead of saying guns are butter, we could say the choice is pensionees, pensioners, or current recipients, right? That's too, in, the, that's in the very too, broad, in the very broad argument, I, I would that, that be, would that, that be somewhat, fair? That somewhat, would that be fair? That's somewhat simplistic. Uh, the, the, but it, the, the, sim the, simplistic is often the, right. The, 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 the difficulty is the pension payments are weighing us down, and unless there are uh, unless there are reforms, fair reforms made then this state is never going to move forward. It's never going to get out of the hole that we have dug. And getting back to that, maybe we can put up on the screen those pension reform variables maybe put up. I think it's, uh, what do we call it, cut number 15? Pension reform, we'll see if we can get that up there because it'll list the variables and the most important one, there are three or four, but the most important one listed there is the COLA, the cost of living adjustment. It's the hugest, it's the biggest driver okay. of, of pension costs. So people, if our legislators, our reps and state centers, now we, we're taping the show on June 6th and you see there, Pension reform factors B. This is we'll see pension reform factors A in a second. Um, but retiree COLA, cost of living index, retiree health care payment. I don't have the bond payment up there, but that those two items account for about six point five billion dollars. Well then we have the issue of Illinois constitutional interpretation. We'll come back to that. Then we have the issue of who pays, which is the issue of school districts deciding factors that affect pension costs but not having to pay. That is, the school district doesn't pay, the whole state pays. But that factor, that COLA thing, really just sticks out there. And, and so that's it's something to keep in mind. And, you, and as I said, we're taping this on the 6th. On this day, the four tops, what we used to call the four tops, that would be Senate, the four major leaders in the legislature, Madigan and Cullerton on the Democratic side and the minority side, 
or the Republican side, it would be, it would be Redonio and Cross, met with the governor, Four Tops and the governor, and you tell us what was decided today. Uh, nothing was decided today. Uh, ideas were tossed around and they decided to come back in a couple of weeks, 19th, 20th, 21st of June, and meet again. And, and why is that? I mean, we, they've had four months at least, this, well, longer. The, se the session started, what, in January, right? Yes. And we go through May. It's supposed to be a citizen politician state. You're not supposed to be full time there. So you spend five months. Number one, most of this gets done in the last day or two. The cynics would say, they do that intentionally, Jeff, because then they can cram things through where people don't have time. We saw State Representative Michael Bost almost go crazy <laughs> because he, he erupted and he threw all the papers. He said, you hand me this legislation the day before we're supposed to adjourn. How am I supposed to go through this? How am I supposed to do my job? Mr. Boss had a point, right? Oh, I think he had a point. Um, and it's unfortunate that we face, the, I think, the greatest uh, crisis that this state has ever faced when it comes to pensions and to put out a pension bill two days before the end of session with not all of the parties involved in that pension uh, legislation is simply the wrong way to go. Let me cite or compare Illinois with the small state of Rhode Island who had a pension problem that percentage-wise was just as big as ours. Dollar-wise, it was about one-tenth the size of ours, but what their, they their do? states about what did they do? They had, a, they had a state leader, their, uh, their uh, treasurer, Gina Romando. Gina Romando said, went to all of the little villages and hamlets and cities and towns throughout Rhode Island and said, ladies and gentlemen, this state has a serious pension problem. And if we don't act, we're going to be lost. And she mobilized the citizens to get their legislators to act. Let me we need leadership like okay. that in Illinois. We're going to continue to speak as the credits roll, but I very much want to thank our guest, State Representative David Harris. He's running for re-election. He has an opponent on the Democratic side. We hope that opponent will come upon here and we'll talk more broadly the issues. Thank you so much, State Representative David Harris. I should say two-star General David Harris for Always coming good here. to talk to you. Appreciate it. Let me round it out quickly because we've covered the COLA. Let me show those other pension variables if we can get, I think it's cut number 14, because it shows in addition to the COLA, they could also adjust the retirement age. They could also adjust the percentage paid by the employee. Pat Quinn, Governor Pat Quinn suggested those two factors along with the COLA. So three major factors, but your complaint is you're saying Governor Pat Quinn didn't do what they did in Rhode Island, that state treasurer, going village to village, hamlet to hamlet, arguing for that. He came up with this proposal, he kind of let it sit out there, and then he didn't, he didn't exercise the leadership. That's your point. We're not saying we agree with you. We'd like Governor Pat Quinn to come on this show. We've invited him. He hasn't been here yet. We hope he'll come and exercise leadership by telling our viewers in Rockford, in Aurora, in Chicago, and indeed around the state of Illinois, where we often air on the Illinois Channel, what needs to be done. He should do that, right? That's the power but to be of the fair, bully pulpit. The Republican leaders should do that too. No, they don't, have the, don't, do have, they don't have the same. They don't have the same bully pulpit. Well, let them argue, and if the media don't cover it, then you can make the point. But they could go to Hamlet to Hamlet, and if the media come, then they'll be exercising leadership, and eventually they'll be in the majority, right? Because yeah. they will have been leaders. People know who the governor is. They don't know who the minority leader of the House or the minority they leader of the Senate. They know Tom Cross. He's he's no, the Republican don't. leader. No, they don't. They know they Chris Redonio. No, they don't. She's the with Senate respect, Republican leader. With all due respect to the leaders. You have to run statewide. You have to have a statewide leader. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.